Um, we now have time for questions. If you could say who you are when you ask a question, there are, I think, some roving uh, mics. Uh, so there's one right, let's go right over in the corner to start with, shall we? Uh, thank you. It's uh, Richard Partington from The Guardian. I um, just wanted to ask why the earnings of the top 0.1% are rising faster um, and what that says about the structure of the economy and the way it's been changed over the past 10 years. I'm not sure if we know. I mean, remember the top 0.1% are on several hundred thousand pounds a year. The top 1% we're looking at sort of 150,000, but the 0.1% we're looking at several hundred thousand. So we're right at the top of the um, uh, right at the top of the distribution uh, there um, I think it is important as I said to put this in the context of you know, certainly six or seven years in which we weren't seeing that we weren't seeing the top one percent uh, pulling away from the rest as we did actually for 20 years before the crisis when they were um, where, where, where they were pulling away whether this is uh, a sense of you know, a return to normality at that point um, I don't know uh, whether there are you know, particular shortages in some of those um, areas, uh, I don't know. We know that there are all sorts of issues around C CEO pay and pay in the financial sector. Maybe they're returning back to where they were uh, pre-crisis, but I, I don't know whether Carl or Jonathan you have any other thoughts on that. No. Questions there? Yeah, front. Uh, Phil Aldrich at the Times. Uh, just again on, on uh, the 0.1%. Uh, the, the th there's about 30,000 people in that group, um, I think. Um, and uh, is it possible that you could just have, th this can be a very volatile uh, number because, I mean, I, I, some people will get um, maybe, like Beth Coates from Bet365 took something like, I don't know, 150 million pounds. Um, and so <coughs> well, if that's all in salary, then, then can, that, can, can there be this distorting influence? And just on uh, this, the last things that you were mentioning, um, uh, is that you effectively saying we've got some very big stealth taxes going on in terms of the fiscal drag? Um, I mean, on the first of those, I mean, I think the, you know, they, um, I think the top 0.1% number we have is the percentile point, so the 99.9 percentile rather than the average of the top 0.1. Is that right? I think so. Um, so that shouldn't be affected by one person at the top. And it's also, as you'll have seen from the chart that Carl showed, it, it seems to be true at the sort of 98th and 97th and so on percentile as well. We don't know, you know, I mean, this may just be a couple of years or it may, uh, it, it may, be, um, it may be persistent. But again, just to stress, it, that's not been the pattern on the whole since um, you know, over the period 2010 to 2015, uh, at least. It seems to be a, a new phenomenon. Um, on the um, uh, stealth tax question, uh, I mean, th th these are not huge effects yet, but I think it is. Um, I mean, c clearly, we are moving, as I said, 50% more people than expected, as it were, when it was first mooted in that over £100,000 bracket. So something that was affecting... Um, I, can't remember the numbers. I have them somewhere. Some, what, what are the numbers on the fifth? It's a million people now, I think, with more than £100,000, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So there's about a million people now, um, quite a large number, with um, income of more than £100,000. Um, that's 50% more uh, than there were with more than £100,000 back in uh, at, at the end of the 2000s. So that's clearly bringing a lot more people into... Um, are both that sort of higher marginal rate, but also with higher average rates where they got incomes um, uh, above that. And something, you know, which if it's held there, will continue to drag more people in as the um, income distribution gets thicker around that area. Um, can you just add a couple, oh, yeah. a couple of extra things on that? I mean, so the, the top 0.1% is about 30,000 people. The OBR numbers are the average earnings amongst that group. I think they could be pretty volatile because of a small number of people earning very, very large amounts one year and perhaps not the next. But they have got the whole population of that people in the RTI data. It's not a sample. So it's not volatility that's driven by sampling variation. It's genuine volatility. So I think it could be volatile. The OBR had assumed that their income growth would slow a bit a few years ago, partly because that's what they'd seen in the data, partly perhaps because of Brexit. Um, so even if they grew at the same as everyone else, it would mean that the forecast would improve a bit, I think. Um, on the failure to index, I think it's worth noting with the child benefit takeaway, originally the policy was to take <coughs> it away from families that contained a higher rate taxpayer. Because there was a 
some Conservative MPs unhappy about that, Mr Osborne changed it to be 50,000. Now, of course, ironically, because the 50,000 hasn't been indexed at all, but the higher rate threshold has gone up, from 2020, or maybe 2021, we're going to see families who do not contain a higher rate taxpayer starting to lose their child benefit. So because of that giveaway that Mr Osborne did, moving from instead of saying take it away from just higher rate taxpayers, we'll set the threshold at 50,000, combined with the failure to index the 50,000, we're actually going to end up being less generous than the original policy. Now that, to me, feels reasonably stealthy. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I mean, one, um, actually, one word of advertisement. Um, Tom, we're bringing something out on the top 1% quite soon, aren't we? Do we know when? We don't know when yet. Next couple of months. That's when, when, when the government lets it out their data lab. Um, but, uh, but we are bringing out a publication within the next couple of months, which will be looking specifically at what's going on in the top 1%. <coughs> Uh, Tim Wallace at The Telegraph. On these long-term challenges with the ageing population, just how big could spending get and tax get as a share of GDP over the next 10, 20, 30 years? Well, I mean, as, um, I mean so, so, so take, I mean, look at the, uh, where, where, where's the chart? So, so that, you know, that's the, uh, that, that's the chart essentially derived from the OBR looking at the, um, pressures on spending health, pensions and long-term care. Now, clearly we don't have to accommodate those pressures. We could to do, choose to do something different, but what you're looking at there is a move from about 15% of national income now to, if you're looking 20 years, um, hence to more than 20% uh, more than of national income. So that's, just, that's 5% over a couple of decades. That's £100 billion pounds over a couple of decades in terms of additional pressures. So if you were to say, well, let's accommodate that and not cut ever s other stuff, 5% of national income, is, I'll, that's a lot. I mean, that would take spending from uh, whatever it is at the moment, 38% to 43% of national income. Now, that's not out of line with what other countries do. That is doable, uh, but it would require clearly um, significant, um, significant tax rises. Tax rises that other countries manage at the moment, uh, but which would take us to levels we've, we've really not seen before. Um, the definition of austerity as squeeze on spending by government departments is one definition, but a lot of people might also include the benefit freeze in that, and you've highlighted that. I'd be interested to know, if the government were to lift the benefit freeze now, whether that would explode the Chancellor's chances of meeting his fiscal targets? I mean, the freeze is only there for this coming year. It's not indefinite. So, I mean, that's a billion, billion and a half. This, this year's freeze is saving... Yeah, like if you reverse the whole thing, it'd be four and a half billion. Yeah. Uh, it's less than half of that. Yeah. So, so this year's One freeze is something in the order of a billion and a half it's saving the government. The overall freeze has saved about four and a half billion. Yeah. Put it another way, it's taken four and a half billion out of the incomes of benefit recipients. Um, it, is, it ends this year, so it's not... Well, supposedly it ends this year, so it's not an ongoing thing. Um, reversing it, unlikely, I think, but it's four and a half billion cost. <laughs> There's one here. Um, yeah, just uh, on on the um, on on uh, the fiscal headroom that he's got. You said a 1.5 percent hit would uh, 1.5 sure 1.5 percent would eliminate that fiscal headroom. Have you done any modelling for what a no a no deal Brexit? What size of shock a no deal Brexit would deliver? We haven't done our own modelling, no. Uh, no, the OBR runs a scenario analysis on in their, in their EFO where they stress the two uncertainties, one being the outlook for productivity growth, and they give you a ready reckoner on that, the other one being the outlook for the number of people who want to come to the UK and work here. They think they're the two key uncertainties. So if we get less of productivity growth and we have few people, fewer people coming here to work here, that's how you get a bad scenario for the public finances. Um, and I don't know if I could just get another quick one. Um, have you put any number on in terms of billions on how much money is, is, is being, how much extra money is going to the Treasury because they haven't indexed things which were previously indexed. Is there a sort of sensible figure we can put around that? 
Uh, I don't know if we have. I mean, they're clearly, it's clearly costing them a lot by not indexing fuel duty. I mean, the answer there is they're losing more than five billion a year for not indexing that, and they won't be making anything like that up um, from uh, the failure to index other things yet, I wouldn't have thought. Uh, Jeffrey Mushins from Tice. How much has the government stamp duty levels cost them in lost, foregone stamp duty, do you think? I don't know. Carl? Because it's a cracker system. Uh, well, we certainly agree it's a cracker system. Uh, <laughs> and you can quote us on that. Yeah. It's certainly a very, very bad tax, but it does raise, I mean, one of the challenges that raises quite a lot of revenue. Um, there are better ways of raising that money for sure. Um, but it's, no, it's not a good tax. Um, and it, it would be one of the challenges would be could we get rid of that, get rid of council tax and replace them with a sensible tax on housing. There's a woman at the back there. Thanks. Delphine Strauss from the FT. Um, it was a question on the deal dividend. Uh, you mentioned one issue around um, debt interest payments perhaps being higher if Brexit goes smoothly. Are there any other issues you'd flag up um, that would mean that the deal dividend is potentially not as big as the Chancellor says it is? I think it's really the description of it as a deal dividend. I mean, the forecasts um, assume that we're going to get a smooth Brexit in all regards, apart from this debt interest thing, where perhaps actually debt interest will turn out to be a bit higher than the OBR expects if we do get the smooth Brexit they're, they're assuming. Um, the £15 billion, pounds, or what the Chancellor described as £26 billion, pounds, is only relative to kind of a relatively arbitrary 2% cap on the deficit that he chose to set himself a couple of years ago. Um, and clearly, relative to a target of eliminating the deficit, there's no room to manoeuvre. So it depends a bit on you know, the Chancellor set himself a target for this Parliament. He's got a lot of wiggle room for that on his current forecast. He's also supposed to have a target for 2025 where he has absolutely no wiggle room. Um, so it's really a question about which ones he's taking seriously and where does he, you know, how does he want to trade off tax and spend relative to the deficit. I think the key issue here is it's strange to refer to a deal dividend against his current forecasts when the forecasters are assuming a deal. Um, so, uh, so, so, so were we in a world in which that forecast was assuming something other than a deal, uh, then relative to that you might think there was a dividend. Uh, but, 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 but given what's forecast, um, that's, you know, that's the, you know, that, that in a sense is arguably the best case scenario. I mean, or at least it's a central case of you know, what happens if we get a deal. I, I think what the Chancellor all, all, probably doesn't, isn't allowed to say is what he's really talking about is a negative dividend from not having, uh, not having, uh, not having a deal. Um, but the, you know, the, I think the underlying point is the public finances, you know, in terms of borrowing, are looking pretty good. Um, and uh, you know, if, if that carries on, then you could keep borrowing below 2% of national income and spend a fair bit more. I mean, that's really what he's saying. Um, and, of course, if the forecast will turn out worse, perhaps because of what might happen with Brexit, then, uh, then you just don't, you don't have that headroom. Thanks. Devin Galani from Policy and Practice. Um, we do quite a bit of work with administrative data, and I quite like the chart you had on RTI looking at how earnings for the top 1% had gone up. The question I've got is, how, uh, assuming that information is received as rapidly as it, as it needs to be for the purpose of administering universal credit, how, I hadn't thought about it higher up the income scale, how quickly can you see, for example, changes in behaviour as um, tax rates at the higher end change? Can you start to, is it sort of responsive enough to start to create a more responsive or more reactive tax system to, to deal with how, how people might respond to incentives in the tax or benefit system? I should say the, the chart you saw was from ASHI. We, we don't have access to RTI data, I'm afraid. But. Yeah, and I think potentially that, so in principle, <coughs> yes, if we had access to RTI data, you could look at those issues. A big challenge is often you're looking at income tax changes, and the RTI data tells you about earnings. And particularly at the top of the distribution, there's going to be people with a lot of unearned income, so you can't, you're, you're looking at a bit of their income, not all of it. So you don't necessarily know, for example, what tax rate they face and how that's changing. Um, so there are some limitations there. You don't know, for example, whether they're putting their earnings into a pension and therefore are not subject to income tax on that. I mean, the other thing to say is if you see responses in terms of incomes or earnings to tax rate changes, you don't necessarily know whether that's kind of real, true, long-term behaviour about work and effort and things like that or 
timing of when people take their incomes. The, the, the first one, the, the latter one is easier to see and the second one's harder to see and more interesting. We would love access to more administrative data and you know, quicker than we currently get. Um, uh, there, there, there's, there's no doubt about that. I mean, it's worth saying th th those, I mean, as I said, th those are all earnings things. So you know, partners in you know, big law and accountancy firms don't show up in that because that's not earnings data, for, ins for instance. Any further? Yeah. This is Jamie Jenkins, Standard Life Aberdeen. Um, just, I realise it's out with the scope of the Chancellor, but I mean a key <coughs> lever in our economy is interest rates, and I'm just interested in your thoughts on to what extent is that a usable lever in the years ahead? Because they can't go down, they can't go down much, and they can't realistically go up much with households so entrenched in mortgage and debt. Is that a fair assessment, or or, or do you think there's more flexibility there than I give them credit for? We, um, we try not to say too much about interest rates being the Ministry for Fiscal Studies, but um, uh, you know, the, the, I, mean, I mean, one thing I'll say is that I mean, the bank have made it fairly clear that they want interest rates to return to closer to normal levels before they, for example, unwind QE. So if we if we move to a slight, somewhat um, tighter monetary policy at any point, it will start off through um, higher interest rates. I mean, the second thing it might be worth saying is that you. In, 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 if we get a, a no deal Brexit and if that starts to have significant negative effects, uh, then the, the, there's a hard challenge both for monetary and fiscal policy. Because if those negative effects are on the supply side, you know, uh, problems at ports and getting stuff in and shortages or what have you, then sticking loads more money in people's pockets is actually going to make things worse because it will increase um, inflation equally. It, you might expect it also to have a demand effect, in which case you might want to be easing monetary or, or fiscal policy. Um, how, how that plays out, and this is one of the reasons why, um, you know, I think some of the messages from the bank have looked quite difficult to interpret, because the uh, because they because they this is a difficult question that they that they will face. I mean, you know, I think everyone in a sense wants interest rates to return at some point to something more like normal um, levels, uh, but you know. All bets are off, as with everything else, until we find out what happens, um, you know, post March the 29th and you know, years thereafter. Hi, Ben Nabarro, Citigroup. I just wanted to ask a quick question on um, on the trade-offs between minimum wages and because I saw you guys used hourly earnings data. And I was just wondering whether you saw any link. I appreciate the point about the, the biting point idea with respect to um, formal unemployment. But, but with respect to um, unconventional working practices or hourly um, um, rates of hours worked, for example, do you see any trade-off with that to date or not particularly? I was just thinking the work of Blundell and so on. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. So... <coughs> My understanding is that like the impact, so theoretically, uh, just in the same way as you could have effects on employment, you could have effects on not necessarily the number of people in work of a, of a minimum wage, but the number of hours of those who are in work. Um, my understanding is that like the effects on employment itself, it's not particularly clear that there are any big negative impacts. And it's also not clear that we've actually seen anything uh, sustained in the data about um, their hours of uh, low pay people have been a bit volatile over the last few years, but it's not clear that we've seen anything remarkable that would you know, uh, suggest that there was anything big going on there. Um, I, spo I, I spot, um, I think, someone from the low pay commission here. If I, if they, hopefully uh, I'm I agreeing uh, with them. <laughs> but, uh, I won't name them, but they might want to comment. I was going to say, about That's unconventional <laughs> working, you know, there are going to be, there is a, uh, minimum wages affect employees and not self-employed people. Uh, there are going to be various different effects when you increase minimum wages on employees but that don't affect self-employed people. That might, for example, increase an incentive for firms to try and organise their labour to... Uh, use self-employed people where they don't have to pay the minimum wage as opposed to the minimum wage. 
it could also lead to people who are self-employed, instead of you know, running along at a small, barely unproductive business, trying to queue for jobs uh, and wait for jobs that are themselves employed. So there are interesting um, trade-offs here and kind of interactions here um, that are not totally clear what, what way they go. I mean, I think it is, um, you know, the, as you put more regulation on the formerly employed labour market, whether that be minimum wages or automatic enrolment or higher levels of national insurance or what have you, the bigger the divide you create between that and being self-employed or a company um, owner-manager. And that's a very difficult, a very difficult um, uh, point at which to make regulation bite and you clearly you know you, you clearly create some incentives in, in in either direction there right is that um, oh, last one at the front um, hi uh, Imran Hussain I'm with the uh, children charity action for children um, the poverty rate for children is double that uh, for pensioners um, and then I think four days time it'd be 20 years I think since Tony Blair did his big speech about ending child poverty in a, in a generation um, I'm just wondering what's your sense of what happened with those two poverty rates for children and for pensioners in the next few years? Jonathan? Or are you perhaps not allowed? <laughs> I'm... Mm, I should... I don't think I should comment. But we're, we're working with data that... Uh, I, I haven't seen this, so I don't know the answer, but Jonathan has seen stuff that he's not allowed to comment on. I mean, I mean what... <laughs> I mean, what, what, we, what we have seen for the last, um, you know, long period is a very big reduction in pension of poverty rates <coughs> as benefits have risen and as more and more have access to private, uh, private incomes. Um, if you look at the last sort of decade, actually, uh, between 2005 and 2015, the reduction in pension of poverty rates has, 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 has stalled. Um, What's going to happen in the future, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that you know, is a challenge for the future is that with the decline of defined benefit occupational pensions, with the very low interest rates and returns in defined contribution uh, pensions, the capacity to um, you know, ha have more money in retirement is clearly going to be harder. But that will be a, short, that will be a long, slow burn as these things change. Much lower rates of owner occupation among 30-year-olds may, <coughs> may translate into more pensioners in 20 or 30 years' time being in private rented accommodation. That will clearly have an impact on their uh, living standards. So there's lots going on um, uh, there for uh, for pensioners. Um, something's going still in a positive direction. Uh, the triple lock, the single tier pension, and so on, um, is is helping people at that bottom end. We should probably draw this to a close. It is now um, 11.29. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you particularly for coming, given that you can't have had very high expectations, given the, uh, uh, how little there was uh, yesterday. So thank you so much for giving up your, uh, your morning. And hopefully we'll have some very exciting things to say come October or November after the budget. Thank you very much.